warm welcome to Professor Ben Stappers. <laughs> have to pay off your PhD students these days to give a decent introduction. All right, thank you everybody for, uh, for coming this afternoon. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who were here uh, just a short while ago for the talk by Sally Cooper, um, I do apologize, there will be some material that is similar, uh, but we're coming from very different angles. I will not be mentioning dating apps at all. Uh, but I will say uh, that basically what I'm talking about are the, the children of uh, some of the relationships that she was mentioning in her talk. And for those of you who, won't, who weren't here, you'll be uh, totally bemused by that statement. So what I want to talk about is uh, the best clocks in the universe, pulsars, and in particular what I'm going to be talking about is how we can use pulsars to learn more about our own solar system uh, and also about potential solar systems around other pulsars. So as I'll introduce to you shortly, the first exoplanets we knew about, so that's planets outside of our solar system, were actually found orbiting pulsars and we'll show you how that was done shortly. So neutron stars are the objects that remain after a star which weighs around about 8 to 20 times the mass of the sun uh, go supernova. And basically what that means is that a star of that mass, when it runs out of fuel, uh, it collapses in on itself. And that collapse increases the pressure inside that star to such an extent that protons and electrons fuse together to form neutrons and effectively we end up with this object called the neutron star. So as this star, we call it an explosion, but actually it's a collapse initially. So first you see the, um, you f you first, the collapse happens and then what happens is you get this pressure build up, you get a hard surface that forms of these neutrons and from that hard surface the rest of the material actually bounces off it. And that's what you see here. This material that you see in this simulation is the so-called supernova remnant. And the supernova remnant is that material that's left behind, that's blown off that star. And in the middle, you're left with this object called a neutron star. And these neutron stars are incredibly small. So remember, we started off with a star that was something like around 8 to 20 times the mass of the sun and we've compacted it down to an object that is actually about the size of a city. So this, to absolute true scale, is the size of a neutron star uh, compared to uh, the city of Manchester. And so if one was to fall on your city, uh, this is where I would live outside of, basically. So, what does this mean? This means that we've compacted a one and a half solar masses, so one and a half times the mass of our sun, we've compacted that down into a radius of just 10 kilometers. And that means we've created an extremely dense object. You might ask yourself, how dense? Well, neutron stars have a mass of this 1.5 times our sun in a radius of 10 kilometers. If you had a teaspoon full of neutron star material, so if you could somehow dip a teaspoon into a neutron star, then what you'd find is that it weighs as much as, <laughs> singing's worse than mine. Um, the star material weighs much as a one billion elephants. Okay, so, uh, it's just in case you don't know what an elephant is, uh, this is an elephant, and this is about six billion elephants, uh, which is equal to one teaspoonful of neutron star material. So my talk was about pulsars. So what's the relationship between pulsars and neutron stars? Well, a pulsar, excuse me, sorry. A pulsar is a specific type of neutron star. It's one which has an extremely strong magnetic field that's what we're showing here with these lines. So these lines here are indicating magnet magnetic field lines, just like the magnetic field of the Earth. The neutron star has a north and a south pole. And from these north and south poles, the very strong magnetic field generates an electric field that pulls 
material from the neutron star surface. That material speeds along the magnetic field lines, and as it speeds along the magnetic field lines, it generates radio waves. And those radio waves are the thing that we can pick up with the telescopes, like the Lovell telescope just across the field here. So these radio pulsars are rapidly spinning, and they have um, high magnetic field strengths. So what do I mean by rapid spinning? Well, here is an example of uh, the conservation of angular momentum as demonstrated by uh, this nice animation from DeviantArt of a ballerina dancing. And as the ballet dancer uh, brings their arms in, you notice that their spin rate increases. And as they move them out again, they decrease. And this is exactly what happens in the case when we form a neutron star. The neutron star was originally a star with a mass of something like 8 to 20 solar masses, as I mentioned. This means that it was much, much larger. It had an enormous radius. The radius would reach all the way out to beyond Jupiter inside our own, if we were considering our solar system. So we've taken an object that was reaching pretty much to Jupiter, and we've shrunk it down to just 10 kilometers. And if that object originally spun maybe once every 30 days or so, if we now shrink it down to this 10 kilometers, it's going to spin somewhere around once a second or so. So suddenly, we've created this object, a neutron star, with an ultra-strong magnetic field that's spinning once every second or so. But it turns out that pulsars can go even faster than that. And how do they go faster? Well, they have to borrow from a friend. Hang on one second. I'm just waiting for this slide to appear. So they need to borrow from a friend. And what that means is they need to accrete material from a companion star. So if they're in a binary system with another star that just happens to, um, excuse me, uh, once the neutron star is formed, you end up with a pulsar, and you've got another star uh, nearby. And that star, sorry, I'm just going to have to stop this because the animation's not playing. One, sorry, one second. Right. OK. Um, We'll, uh, we'll carry on for a second, and uh, hopefully that'll come back in a moment. So what we have is we had a neutron star. It was spinning. It had a nice, strong magnetic field. It has a companion star. The companion star is uh, maybe something like around our sun or something like that. And as it ages, it gets larger. It increases, like our star did that was originally a pulsar, uh, that became the pulsar. And then what happens after that is that we um, the material from that uh, companion star can actually fall onto the pulsar itself. And when it falls onto the pulsar, it actually can spin it up. So it can make it spin more rapidly. So we can go from having a pulsar that spins maybe once per second or so uh, to one that spins um, maybe up to 700 times per second. So we've currently got, so we've gone from once per second to 700 times a second. So we're now talking about an object that can spin uh, up to uh, 700 times a second, and it's the size of a city. So remember that. So at the edge of that body, you're moving at something like one third of the speed of light, or something like that. Okay. So we completely uh, lost the slide. So we'll just have to carry on. Uh, that try and remember what the next slides were. Um, so we've now described to you what a pulsar is. So a pulsar is one of these rapidly rotating objects, and they can spin uh, up to 700 times a second. What is amazing about these objects is because they're so compact uh, and dense, the, it takes a lot of effort to change the rate at which they are spinning. You have to put in a lot of energy if you want to change the rate that they spin. And remember, we mentioned that these objects have very strong magnetic fields. And they were generating radio emission that was um, a beam, was beamed out of those magnetic poles. So every time that the radio emission 
uh, sweeps past you, if you were a telescope, then every time it sweeps past you, you would detect a pulse of radio waves. So you get this pulsed radio emission. And those pulses, you can think of them as being like the ticks of a clock. So every time the pulse goes past, it's like tick, tick, tick. So you've basically built yourself in space a cosmic clock. And so you're able to use these, um, these objects to study uh, their surroundings and whatever um, companion objects they might have. And so this is exactly what we do with the radio telescope, uh, the level telescope just behind us here. And so what other uses can we make of these objects? So one thing we can, one little thought experiment you can do, on a, on especially this weekend when we're all concentrating on thinking about what the role of the, uh, of the moon is, we're thinking about the moon because of the Apollo landings. Um, imagine if the moon didn't reflect sunlight. Would we still know it was there? How would we know it was there? If it didn't reflect sunlight, would we even know that it was there? It turns out that pulsars can actually help answer that question. So the pulsars might be um, able to show, so when the pulsar is um, uh, you're receiving the, these ticks from the pulsar, the ticks are arriving at Earth, uh, and we're trying to measure when those ticks are arriving. And remember I said that anything that changes the rate at which those uh, pulses arrive is interesting. So it's either affecting the pulsar or it's affecting the Earth. And when you have an, the Earth and you have the Moon, when they orbit each other, you always probably think of them as just going like this, right? But actually what happens in reality is that they do something more like this. And what that means is that not only is the moon moving, but so is the Earth. And so the motion of the Earth due to the presence of the, of the moon is what we're able to detect by measuring the arrival times of these pulses from the pulsar. So these pulsar uh, would leave behind a characteristic signal in the arrival times of the pulses from the pulsar uh, in the times when they arrived. So you could actually see this very strong uh, 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 signal which would have a period of about a month and it would be due to the motion of the, uh, of the moon around the Earth. And so we would actually be able to detect uh, the presence of the moon even if we didn't have uh, the, um, even if it didn't reflect sunlight. So it looks like we're going through a reboot. Um, so hopefully we'll get some slides back in a minute. Um, so that's one aspect of, of what you can use pulsars for is trying to detect these interesting objects. And I mentioned already about the fact that we can use pulsars to detect planets. And it works in exactly the same way. So what we have is we have a situation where uh, you have a pulsar. It's, uh, uh, you're receiving the pulses from the pulsar at Earth using your observatory. You're measuring the time when those pulses arrive. And then suddenly, you notice that they deviate from the best idea of when you thought the pulse would arrive. You think the pulse is arriving at a certain time and arrives a little bit later, a little bit early. And you can use this fact to model the presence of an unknown object in the system. And that might be, uh, I have to log in, sorry. That might be due to the presence of another object in an orbit with the pulsar. And so we can do that. And interestingly, in around about 1992, uh, some observations were done uh, of his pulsar 1257 plus 12, which showed some unusual behavior. We weren't receiving the pulses exactly when we expected to receive them. Uh, and so what we could do is um, model those arrival times as being due to the presence of another body in the system. And it turns out, actually, there wasn't just one body. There were two bodies. So there were two planets orbiting this pulsar. 
And so we were able to show that um, for the first time ever, we detected planets outside of our solar system. Um, the next slide is basically... <laughs> seems to be my speciality at Blue Dot is ad-libbing for around about 15 minutes. For, uh, anyway, so uh, pulsars uh, we already mentioned, but I just wanted to highlight that the slowest spinning pulsar is around about once every 23 seconds. The fastest is 1.3 milliseconds, so it spins around in 1.3 milliseconds. Um, at Jodrell Bank, we do these pulsar timing, so there's around about 3,000 pulsars that are known, and we monitor those pulsars at Jodrell Bank, uh, as many of them as we possibly can, and you can see as they spin around, you can see the pulses arriving down here at the telescope. And as I mentioned, you can think of these pulsars as being like cosmic clocks. And so, um, wow, this really doesn't like my presentation, does it? Right, okay, more ad-libbing coming. Right, so um, unfortunately what that was was a nice movie showing pulses, uh, a pulse train, a pulse sequence arriving. Uh, so what, we've, what we were talking about before was this pulsar 1257 plus 12, which has these really uh, interesting planets. So it's got two planets going around it, and it, what they weren't found around a normal star, uh, they were found around a pulsar. And it turns out, actually, there's a third body in the system that was found a little bit later, and that corresponds to probably a moon of some sort. So it has uh, three uh, planets, uh, and, um, and, and one of the, what, two planets, and one of them is a moon. Yeah, well, I don't know. We can try. I'm not really sure what's going on. There's Nothing particularly intense about those films, but um, right. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. So, uh, so what 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 can we do more? So basically, what we've got now is a situation where we've detected the first extrasolar planets. Um, actually. Nobody's that interested because the only type of planets people were interested in at the time were the ones that potentially might host other civilizations. And it was pretty re early on recognized that it was very unlikely that those particular uh, planets could host life, given that they were being bombarded by the relativistic particles streaming off these uh, super dense neutron stars with their high magnetic fields. And so what people then went and did was uh, thought about, okay, what can we do more? Well, what about our own solar system? I already mentioned the problem about the moon and how we can actually, could have detected the moon even if we can't see it. Well, it's long been wondered whether there are other uh, uh, planets in our own solar system. Uh, lots of discussion about it. Um, some of you may think there are nine planets. Um, some of you may think there are eight planets. Uh, and some people actually think that there are nine planets, but the planet they thought was a planet is actually not a planet, and there's one we don't know about. Uh, so there is a planet it's called, uh, that's referred to as Planet Nine, um, which probably used to be Planet Ten, uh, but it's now Planet Nine, uh, which is predicted to be present in the solar system. So by looking at the orbits of these other planets and also at the Kuiper Belt objects, so objects far away from the, uh, uh, from, the, from the sun, located in the area similar to where um, Pluto and Charon are, and in particular something called Sedna, if you've ever heard of it, uh, where they're located, you can look at the orbits of those objects, and those orbits, as they go around the sun, they all have a particular shape and they all have a particular uh, period. And it's believed that this might be related to the fact that there's another object, another planet in our solar system located a long way out that's affecting those objects. So it's perturbing their orbits uh, and controlling them and keeping them in these well-planned orbits. And that's the so-called Planet Nine. So I mentioned to you that anything that makes the uh, presence of the Earth... Uh, sure, I'll just skip all the way down. Yeah, cool, thank you for that. on the wrong way. Right, maybe we'll, in a second we'll get a graph. Um, 
And the, what it will show is that using pulsars, we can actually put some really interesting limits on the presence of this so-called Planet Nine. So this is a slightly complicated plot. I was going to build up to it slowly, but now I've just thrown it at you. Um, this is the separation of the objects. So how far are the objects away from the sun? Uh, and they're in units of astronomical unit. And the astronomical unit is basically the mean distance between the Earth and the sun. Uh, and that's what we show here. So here, of course, is, uh, is uh, uh, the, the, the one astronomical unit. Uh, and here are the locations of all of the known planets. Uh, here is the asteroid belt. Here is the Kuiper belt that I was talking about a little bit earlier on. And what you're seeing here is the stars correspond to the known measured masses of the planets. And these little triangles are the errors on those masses. So how accurately do we know the mass? So uh, we know that the mass of uh, Mercury, for example, is around about 10 to the minus 7 solar masses. So uh, 1 10 millionth of the mass of the sun. Uh, but the error is very small. So we know the mass of Mercury very well. And these lines that you can see here correspond to if I was to get lots of pulsars, so maybe 20 pulsars, and I, they're all excellent clocks. I can measure the arrival time of the pulses of the, from those pulsars to better than, say, 100 nanosecond precision. Okay, so that's 100 divided by 1,000 divided by 1,000 divided by 1,000 is the precision that we can measure these arrival times of the pulsars to. And if I measure them for 10 years, then these are the limits I would have on the masses of the different objects in our solar system. And what you can see in the top right-hand corner there is a nice gray square corresponding to the best prediction of what Planet Nine should look like. So it should be located about 1,000 times further away from the sun than the Earth, uh, and that it should have a mass of around about 1 10 thousandth of the sun. Uh, and if we have uh, 20 pulsars that we can time with 100 nanosecond precision for 10 years, we would be able to measure it. We would be able to measure its presence, and we would know its orbit very accurately. So this is one way that you can try and find this undetected system in uh, our uh, in our solar system. So I'm just going to come back to the 1257 uh, plus 12 planets that I was talking about because, unbeknownst to me, when I was researching this talk, I've known I've always known these planets as A, B, and C. Very practical names, very easy to remember. Unfortunately, while I was ad libbing, I couldn't remember their real names as they've now been given. So one of them, A, is called Droga. I apologize if I don't pronounce ancient Norse correctly. Um, but it's around about 0 0.02 solar masses, so it's the one like a moon. Um, there's one called Phobitor, uh, which uh, um, is around about three time, 3.9 times the mass of the Earth. Uh, and uh, Droga is from ancient Norse mythology and is supposed to mean uh, some sort of demon. A fibator is also supposed to be something that comes and visits you in the night while you're sleeping and comes in the form of a beast. So you can sort of get the idea that maybe these places aren't expected to be very nice to live on. Uh, and then poltergeist, of course, you all know what a poltergeist is in Earth. Uh, you, maybe you've heard of that. So by comparison, you can see how these planets compare to Earth. And they, are the f they were the very first extrasolar planets that were found. So how do you think they might have formed? Well, the question is very interesting because you really wouldn't have predicted it. If anybody had said to you, where are you going to find planets, around pulsars was not the place I would have predicted. And so one way is that I talked about this supernova explosion that happens where the star explodes and all this mass is thrown off out into space. What we think might happen is actually some of that material falls back down. So instead of just blowing away uh, to, to infinite distance, it falls back down and it forms this thing we call a fallback disk. And so this fallback disk might be a place where you could form planets. Um, 
An alternative is, if you were here earlier to, for Sally's talk, you will have heard about these Black Widow pulsars. These are the pulsars that uh, actually destroy their companions. Their companion star here is shown here, and the wind from the pulsar heats this star and blows material off it. And perhaps these planets formed when the, that material was completely destroyed and the star was destroyed and what was left over was able to be used to form, uh, form planets. So the question you might ask yourself is, are there more pulsar planets out there? And this one, one of the things that we've been working on here at Jodrell Bank for quite a while now. And again, I apologize, I was going to lead up to this plot uh, slowly, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll dive in. Uh, what's shown here, oh, let me actually just step to the next one. What's shown here are real measurements made of the arrival times of pulses from the pulsars with our telescopes, the Lovell telescope over there, the 42-foot telescope a little bit further away. These are our own actual measurements, and what you can see here is days, so how many days we've been observing the source. So we've been observing this source in this plot for 2,000 days. Uh, and this is the difference between when we expected the pulse to arrive and when it actually arrived, okay? So it's the difference between our best idea of when the pulse would arrive and when it actually arrived. And this is a simulation. And what I've simulated here is if there was a moon-like planet orbiting that pulsar, what would the signature look like? And you can see, with the quality of the data that we have from our telescope, we would very easily know if there was a moon orbiting this particular pulsar, so a moon-like mass. So you can see that each of these data points lies right on the predicted curve. And so we could very easily detect a moon-like planet. And we haven't detected such a moon-like planet. And so we know that um, this system does not have planets that are heavier than uh, our own moon, for example. So what we can do is we can take our Lovell telescope, and uh, uh, if any of you were here a few years ago for the Halle Orchestra, of course, the Lovell telescope is here doing the most important thing it can do, and that's observing pulsars. Um, and we've used this to record more than a, the equivalent of 16,000 years of rotational history of pulsars. So we observe around about 800 of the 3,000 pulsars that are known, and we've recorded around about 16,000 years of rotational history for those particular pulsars. And we can use this data to try and find new planets around pulsars, and that's exactly what we're doing uh, at the moment. So we're reaching the end of the talk, and I just wanted to touch on uh, the fact that we have this amazing facility uh, just opened a couple of weeks ago on our own site. So the SKA is the Square Kilometer Array. It will be the largest radio telescope uh, in the world, uh, and it will use pulsars to do incredibly interesting science. And part of that uh, science is it will use telescopes in uh, the South African desert, in the Karoo Desert in South Africa, and here in Australia. This is in the Murchison region in Western Australia. Uh, it will use those pulsars to try and detect uh, gravitational waves, uh, and it will also try and find a system that contains a pulsar in orbit with a black hole. And if we find such a system, we will be able to do uh, the most uh, successful tests of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So what have you learned today? Well, you've learned that I can add lib for around about 15 minutes with no slides. Uh, you've also learned that I should really have run through all of my slides and checked that they worked before I gave this talk on this actual projector. Um, but hopefully what you also learned is that pulsars are extreme objects, second only to black holes in terms of gravity and compactness, and they have the most extreme magnetic fields. They provide an amazing tool to understand the physics beyond the reach of the terrestrial laboratory. We can use them to find planets in our own solar system. We can constrain the masses of the planets in our own solar system. But we can also use them to find planets orbiting these actual objects themselves and try and understand how were they formed at all. 
Uh, and we can also perform tests of theories of gravity and detect gravitational waves. Uh, and these cosmic clocks, as we call them, uh, just keep on giving in terms of uh, amazing science that we can do with these objects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. And I know how long he spent on his slides, so it's a shame that you didn't all get to see them. Um, but nevertheless, still an amazing talk. So we're going to have a couple of roving mics to answer your, so that you can ask your questions. Make sure you put your hand up nice and high and speak clearly because it is a bit hard to hear from up here. So we have one over there. So put your hand up nice and high and we'll try and get to you. Hi, I'm interested on the planets you found around the Pulsar. Um, my understanding is a star goes supernova to, to create a neutron star. So th don't these stars have already planets around them? What hap a, a remnant, did you say? Um, these, these stars that go supernova, don't they have also planets around them, they orbiting them? Yes, indeed, they may have had planets around them. Uh, but in all likelihood, those planets would have been destroyed in the supernova itself. So one other model is that somehow, maybe, they survived the supernova. But as you could see, those planets are actually very close to the pulsar, right? They're, they actually, if they were way away, maybe they could survive, but they're very close. So I think it's unlikely they survived the original supernova that formed the neutron star. Thank you. Um, the other thing I didn't get to say, because I had a nice video of it, is that this pulsar is spinning very, very rapidly. So it's one of the ones that had to accrete material from a companion star. So we know that it probably had a companion star, which is now gone. So we don't know where that is. So that's, that's interesting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So um, the, neutral, the pulsar is spinning quite fast, isn't it? Yes. And it's got a large mass. Yes. So I imagine it would have quite a lot of energy as well. So why does it emit radio waves and not a higher energy wave? That's a very good question. Um, so the, um, it turns out that you're very, what you say is absolutely correct. The, the kinetic energy of the rotating uh, neutron star is, is very high. Uh, and apparently, not all of that energy. So the, the neutron star is spinning, and the magnetic field causes it to slow down. So it's got a, it, it emits what's called magnetic dipole radiation. And that causes it to slow down. But the radio emission that we detect is actually at less than 1% of the total available energy for that neutron star. Uh, and some neutron stars do emit in gamma rays and x-rays as well. And so up to maybe 60% of the energy that's available can be received in radiation. But we also think that they give off something called a wind, and that wind is not visible to us. We can't detect it. We can only detect that wind if it interacts with something else, like the material around the pulsar. Hi. Um, so from observing these 800 pulsars in the rotational history, have you been able to do some sort of categorization of different types of pulsar, either broadly or narrowly speaking? Uh, yes, yeah, there, there are many, many different types of pulsars. Um, and we, um, we try to look as a, at a broader range as possible. Uh, so I mentioned these pulsars that spin very, very rapidly. We call them millisecond pulsars. Uh, we now know of around about 300 of those. And, um, and we try to time as many of those as we possibly can because of, those are the most precise clocks. Those are the ones where we can get the best measurements, and so they're the ones where we can possibly learn a lot about the gravity theories. Uh, hi. Um, you, uh, you ended your slide on um, your talk on the, the very large scale equipment that's used to detect pulsars. Uh, what about at the other end of the scale? I mean, could you, could you detect these objects using equipment on a much smaller scale? <clears throat> uh, in some cases you can, yes. So um, I mentioned our 42-foot telescope, or 13 meters in, in old money, in new money, I should say. Um, uh, I'm not that old. Um, and so the 13-meter telescope does a lot of interesting science. Um, the brightest pulsars, of which there are around four or five, uh, you can actually detect, I always like to say, with a wet piece of string, uh, or a coat hanger is actually more appropriate. So there are some very bright pulsars that can be observed with quite small instruments. Um, 
but there are a lot that are a lot fainter. So you can do some interesting stuff with quite a small dish. The smallest one we use here on site is seven meters. Um, but yeah, you can, there are some interesting things you can do with small dishes. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, how exactly do you use uh, pulsars to detect gravitational waves? Yes. OK, very good question. So the way we do this is the way uh, that I was mentioning before. So what we do is um, I mentioned about anything that ch causes a change in the Earth, right? So remember, I was, meaning about, I was mentioning about the moon, and the moon is orbiting the Earth. That causes the Earth to move. When a gravitational wave passes by the Earth, it changes the apparent distance between the Earth and a pulsar. So the gravitational wave distorts space and time, and that distortion changes the apparent distance. So what you would see is um, you would see uh, some of the pulses from a pulsar in this direction. Uh, if the gravitational wave, say, was coming in that, from that direction, uh, you would see the pulses arrive a little early from this pulsar and a little late from this pulsar. So what you do is you correlate the signals from all of these pulsars together. So that's why you need a lot. You need 20 pulsars or more, all distributed all over the sky. You correlate the signal. So you say, which ones were early, which ones are late. And if they match what you expect for a gravitational wave, then you know you've detected a gravitational wave. How, how long does a pulsar stay as an actual pulsar? And what does it degrade into after? Because obviously, a star that's used all its fuel may turn into a, what's the lifespan of an actual pulsar? What does it turn into afterwards? Yeah, uh, so when a, a neutron star is formed, when it turns into a pulsar, um, if it was not, uh, sorry, if it just formed a neutron star, if it wasn't a pulsar, if it didn't give off radio emission, uh, it would be an X-ray source. It would emit X-rays because it's hot. When they're first born, you can imagine they get really hot. So they give off X-rays. Um, but that cools down very quickly, uh, and then it would be absolutely totally invisible to us because we would not be able to detect it. We don't have the sensitivity to be able to detect it. If it's a radio pulsar, typically you can detect radio emission from pulsars for of the order of about 100 million years. So after, the, after it's born, you can detect it for around 100 million years. Um, I, yeah, I haven't been working on them for that long. Uh, but the, uh, what happens then is that uh, the radio emission turns off, and we, think that, and we consider them to be dead. And they will just continue to exist until the end of the universe. So they will just continue to happily orbit around the galaxy um, until whatever happens at the end of the universe happens, and then... Uh, that will be the case. If, uh, if they have a companion star, then they can be what we call reborn. Uh, and that was the bit I mentioned about if the material can come from the companion star, it can fall onto, this other, onto the neutron star that has died, but then it gets spun up fast enough that it restarts to emit um, uh, radio waves, and we detect it again. But now it's spinning maybe five, 600 times. And those objects, we think, uh, keep emitting radio waves for maybe a billion years. Okay, before we thank Ben again, um, if you want to find out more about pulsars, the Pulsar Hunters Stand is actually in the database section just behind here, and you might even find, oh, that way. I'm terrible at directions. That way? I was right, yes. Um, so you might even find Ben there to ask more questions. But let's thank Ben again for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thanks for the patience. Sorry about the talk. <laughs>